Hi, everybody. How are we doing? Oh, my God. Come on, come on. <laughs> Thank you for having us here. I'm extremely excited to be moderating this extremely quick panel. Um, so I feel like we're running kind of a game show um, ensemble here. So we have 20 minutes to talk to basically the most important people on the Internet of Things in the industry right now. So Alicia Asin, you mm -hmm. are uh, CEO of Labellium, mm -hmm. which is based in Zaragoza in mm -hmm. Spain. Michael, you are CEO and co-founder of LogMeIn, which is, uh, I heard uh, very recently, was just born in Budapest, but um, also has offices around the world, 600 people. How many uh, people in Labellium? 40. 40. Mm -hmm. um, and really, out of the entire description of this panel, you'll be disappointed to see that we don't necessarily address the what is the Internet of Thing. I'm entirely... Uh, uh, hoping that you will just Google that for yourselves. What I wanted to uh, address is really what are the business opportunities and what is the business landscape like at the moment. Um, so, Michael, uh, you joined uh, LogMeIn in 2009. Um, we're now in 2013. What's changed for you and your business? Well, essentially, when we think about the Internet of Things, mm -hmm. we got very active in it late 2009 or early 2010. And LogMeIn's a public company, so we have to report out you know, very frequently to our shareholders. And for years, the Internet of Things was perceived as, quote, Michael's science fair project. Mm -hmm. and people were just not excited about it at all. And really, in the last nine months, as we started 2013, there's been a sea change in interest. Um, we actually have a product called Zively, which is a platform as a service for the Internet of Things. And the reason I mention that is a year and a half ago, the people that would show up to use that service, they were developers, but they're really individuals who are really more curious about, or hobbyists, if you will, trying to understand the technology. Today we add, oh gosh, maybe 2,000 companies a month join our platform that are serious developers. And I, I think it's safe to say there isn't a company that makes appliances for the home. There isn't a company that's involved with the distribution of energy or other utilities. Um, there really isn't a company that is involved in distribution or logistics that isn't very interested in the Internet of Things. So I feel like the time has really come and uh, it's now happening as, as we sit here. Excellent. Alicia, you are a computer engineer and mm -hmm. you've been involved with the company since 2006. Mm -hmm. um, on top of a collaboration or a accidental collaboration mm -hmm. with LogMeIn over the Fukushima Geiger sensors, you might want to Google that. Um, anything, has anything changed for you? Yeah, I think that uh, we can see two facts, two main facts. When we started in 2006, uh, there was no term of IoT, the term was sensor networks. And since we were doing this uh, very versatile and horizontal platform, we were attracting all kind of innovators that wanted to experiment at all fields. So our sensors have been used in, in radi for monitoring radiation levels, to monitor stress levels in koalas. That's, I promise, that's true. And to monitor parking spaces, but always in, in small scale, because there were people trying. And since in the past 12 months, we, we've started to see uh, uh, a big change in the, in the kind of customers at, uh, getting attracted by our technology. It's not that anymore uh, so technology enthusiasts and university researchers, but companies with a uh, with, uh, very um, a compelling business case. So uh, now we, we could say that it is happening right now, that for the, for the very first moment, we are seeing uh, scalability in the kind of projects involved in the IoT. And the second thing we have seen is the importance of makers. Of course, makers have been around even before uh, we were talking about uh, wireless sensor networks, but they are taking a very active role in the IoT right now. And that's because there are very inexpensive platforms of open hardware that enable, and because we have platforms of crowdfunding that enable them. So uh, for the first time, we, are, we could say that uh, we are moving from 
an industrial IoT or an IoT only for, uh, for corporations and business to an individuals and consumers IoT, which makes uh, a global IoT. Would you agree with that, Simon? I, I would. I would totally agree. Um, essentially, we hear these terms, oh, there's going to be 50 billion devices uh, on the internet by the end of this decade. What sounds like an extraordinary, now there's about 6 billion devices on the internet today, so a, a factor of 10 increase. I actually viscerally believe, absolutely, without a doubt, uh, it's my belief that that number's low. Um, what we see is pretty much anything with a microcontroller, anything with an on-off switch, even inanimate objects uh, with the, you know, being attached with a QR code are becoming part of, if you will, the known internet, the known uh, world of connected objects. And so uh, I, I actually think it's gone from sort of an R&D project, I wonder if we could somehow control a switch with an iPhone app, to something now where scalability, interoperability, uh, things like policy management, uh, authentication, and security are, are enormous issues for people. And the, the reason they're enormous issues is no longer a question, can we implement some sort of function, but can we deliver this type of experience at the type of scales that are just unknown to the internet today. And so in, to reach those scales, what do we need in terms of um, engagement with those end users, whether they're customers of a business proposition or customers who are buying something at John Lewis and it happens to have connectivity. Uh, what gets us to that hockey stick graph? Well, when I look at the Internet of Things, the reason I'm super excited about and so bullish on it is I think it's rare when you have a, a technology opportunity that simultaneously right now delivers faster, better, cheaper solutions. I mean, just to give you some real numbers, the world economy, broadly speaking, is about $75 trillion. And in most developed countries, about 9% of that economy is in uh, logistics and delivery. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an order of magnitude greater market than, say, advertising, if you were to look at the US market. So you have this $1.4 trillion logistics opportunity just in Europe, just in Europe, each year. And if you can fix that by a little bit, you know, move the needle four, five, six percent over six years, it has enormous economic consequences to all of us. So you have this faster, better, cheaper, making what we do better right now. At the same time, the same exact technology allows you to deliver user experiences to consumers, to individuals that really are delightful, that make things possible that weren't possible before. And so you have new classes of products, home automation, quantified self, uh, things that we can't really even imagine are starting to, to come out quickly. And then if you look on the longer term, let's say five, six, seven, eight years out, you have the opportunity to solve the world's really humongous problems. You know, energy consumption problems, uh, mm -hmm. climate change problems. So this, this technology, which is in, in, in its construction, very simple. We're going to connect things and allow them to interact. You know, we, at the end of the day, we think about connecting people so they can interact with each other and then the world around them. And not a particularly complicated idea, but it's profound in what it can do for us. And I think people are really starting to take uh, notice of that. At the same time, Moore's Law, which we, we kind of take for granted when we look backwards, but it's hard to imagine its impact when we look forward. So when I, I look at you know, a, a $20 bill of materials uh, you know, that cost to, let's say, uh, internet enable a consumer electronic device, uh, perhaps, you know, we have to remember it's, you know, it's going to 40 cents by the end of this decade. And suddenly things that weren't economically feasible mm -hmm. to make internet enabled and part of the IoT totally become uh, feasible. And in, when we don't just think about traffic control systems or industrial pumps, we think about disposable toys as having a brief but important life on the internet. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that, Alicia? Yeah, totally. And, and I think that it's also very important to to be able to populate with the enough infrastructure. So there won't be enough business until we have enough infrastructure. So let's take, 
take the example of smart cities, for example. Now, smart cities are being performed by integrators. IBM can have uh, one city and full of sensors and perform smart parking, smart weight solutions, and control the monitor, environmental, and everything. But um, if we think about the new ecosystem and about the new industry we are creating, uh, we would need a whole country with the same sensors to start uh, enable new businesses, like, for example, trading with the data and even trading with the connectivity options for, the, for those sensor data, uh, enabling, enabling ser services like, a, uh, like a, uh, apps for your smartphone that uh, connect to the sensor network in the city and tells you if the noise levels are too high in this area or not or where can you find a, a parking spot in the, in the city. And, and the more infrastructure, the more players will be coming in. Uh, the more scale the market will be demanding and the, the cheaper will be the, the, the chips, the connectivity chips, and also, again, the bigger the infrastructure. So I think it's, it's taking traction. And uh, w one thing here will be uh, making the traction to, to make it faster, the adoption. Excellent. And um, this is the perfect segue into uh, my final question, I suppose, which is um, you're both based on, and commuting between the US mm -hmm. and Europe. Um, what are the main differences that you see in people's approach to both IoT, but also in terms of their ability to see potential in, in that business uh, and business opportunities, Alethea? Well, um, I think that the, the first thing to say is that the IoT was born, maybe we can say, with the SIGBI protocol. And that was designed specifically to address the industrial automation problem. So uh, we had one technology and then suddenly all the innovators were saying, well, this is very cool. Can we just get this technology outside and use it to monitor forest fires? And, and many people started to apply the concept of wireless communicated and battery power to make all kind of uh, very critical processes and very, uh, and very uh, in, in really harsh conditions for the, for the technology. So uh, I think that there was a very big gap from the, the market demands and the, the market understandings and the, the initial readiness of the, of the technology. So I think that in 2006, uh, we, we saw two things. In the US, uh, I think it, wireless sensor networks lost kind of uh, momentum. It was uh, decreasing. While in Europe, we have FP7 and uh, European Commission uh, grants to, to fund research projects. The, the kind of projects you need to do to, need to know uh, what happens if you just spread 2,000 nodes in a, in a forest for two years. What happens? Well, I don't know. Nobody knows. And, but you really need to invest that money just for research. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that in these funds have been critical to put uh, Europe, Europe in a more um, <coughs> strength position in technology terms, at least. And that's why there are so many startups doing hardware and network protocols and, and smart cities here in Europe, because we have the back of that. Michael, you guys acquired uh, Patch Bay, now um, launched as Zively very recently. Uh, was there an opportunity there that you think is uh, unique to Europe? Well, I, I do think there is sort of a, a fundamental difference between early adopters of uh, connected object uh, solutions between, say, North America and, and Europe. Um, and this is very broad brush, but if, if I were to look at our customers here, they're typically focused on efficiency. How can we improve uh, a problem? How can we uh, solve something in a way that, uh, that uses less resources? If we were to look at our, our US customers, they're more interested in the experience. 
You know, they're trying to solve a problem not from an efficiency or a consumption of resources, but can we deliver something to either our customers or our partners or end users that is, is differentiated? Mm -hmm. and, and there's, I think, a great example, which is just coming, I just learned earlier, coming to England shortly, there's a very successful thermostat in the U.S. called the Nest. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, you could argue it's an Internet of Things, uh, first really big scale mm -hmm. successful consumer product. Um, and if you look at the reviews, it's a loved product, and if you look at the reviews, it's all about, it looks great. Mm -hmm. Number two is it's, I can use my iPhone. And number three will be, I might save some energy with it. And it, the whole <laughs> nexus of that product was to be more efficient and save energy. If we look, you know, here we're, uh, there's a product called Current Cost, um, which we were, uh, we had the good fortune, some of us up here had the chance to participate in this project. It's 100% about uh, reducing energy consumption in, in households. And I think that's sort of, you know, uh, illustrative of the differences we see right now. But I think these things will balance out as we go forward in the next couple of years. Um, and so to finish off, uh, your sort of key thing, you know, your, your, uh, uh, if you were to cast your eye on the future, what do you think will happen in the next sort of 12 months if things have changed dramatically in the last 12 months? Uh, what do you think is going to be uh, the next sort of step that the Internet of Things will take, Alicia? Well, I think that, not, not sure if it will happen in the next 12 months, but uh, I, my dream is that IoT and smart cities will be able to drive more transparency to the governments to help us to make more uh, clever solutions when, when we are voting to base in facts of uh, the measuring everything. Uh, we need to, the, the IoT is all about the, the new culture of measuring things measuring processes and then improve them. Mm -hmm. So uh, we really need that in governments and there's a, a, a social claim globally for that. So I think that's going to be the, maybe the most important uh, legacy of the IoT in not sure in the 12 months but for sure in the future. Very soon. Michael? Yeah, I, th I think you're going to start to take for granted um, as we go into 2015, not necessarily the next 12 months. In the next 12 months, people are building a lot of things that are going to enter your lives um, that have, you know, the IoT as sort of an assumption. From coffee makers to parking meters uh, to vending devices. So we've long known about, like, for example, a Coca-Cola machine that is internet enabled and can report, hey, I need, you know, more Sprite or whatever. But that the technology now, the Coca-Cola machine might generate $25,000 a year in, in receipts. We're starting to see that sort of technology trickle down to things like gumball machines that might generate $1,500 a year in, in revenue. And so it's not going to be an aha moment, but you're suddenly going to see more, we believe that you'll see more and more things that you just bump into that are are smart, aware of their surroundings, and, and part of a, a bigger network of, of smarter things in our world. Michael, Alicia, thank you so very much for being with us today and sharing your thoughts. Thank you to everyone here for not falling asleep. And uh, if you have any questions for Alicia and Michael, um, we're going you know, you guys will be around all day uh, and use the hashtag uh, Structure Europe. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.